Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of A Mic on the Podium with me, Michael Seal. Today, I conduct a conversation with a British conductor who, after studying French and UK law, went on to study piano and conducting in Vienna, and then entered the German Kapellmeister system, eventually becoming general music director in Braunschweig. His career since has been highly successful in both the Opera House and in the Concert Hall. It's a great pleasure to welcome Alexander Joel. Alex, lovely to see you, to meet you, and to speak with you today. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Good. Uh, you're telling me you're in Nancy. Are you there working opera or symphonic? Yeah, I'm doing an opera production. I'm doing uh, Rigoletto. Very nice. Um, I'm going to go, as I always do, right back to the very beginning. I know that you're a pianist, but was that your first musical experience, starting the piano? When did you start the piano, and how did music come into your life? Uh, I started when I was, well, was about six, and we lived in Vienna at the time. And um, I got into music because, well, I got piano lessons when I was a child, but my father was a very good pianist. I mean, he wasn't a pianist professionally, he was an engineer, but he played the piano very well. And he brought me to, they, my parents brought me to various operas and operettas and concerts when I was from a very young age. So um, that's how I got... Uh, I got introduced to music, so I was very lucky and fortunate to be in contact with classical music since I was a very small child, and I was very fortunate to be living in Vienna at the time, well, where there's, I, of course, a lot of uh, music. I was going to say, what a lucky place to grow up, um, just full of music. And so it sounds like you were taken to classical music concerts, operas, from an early age, and so your parents loved classical music. Yes. Mm. We lived next to... Uh, they have in Vienna these places called Heidegen, which are like these kind of on the outskirts of Vienna. Well, it's still in Vienna, but it's on the in the uh, on the outskirts. There are these places called Heidegen, which are the wine bars and the vineyards where they serve the wine, and they always had Viennese music playing there. So you know, like a violin and a double bass and a I don't know a, um, a harmonica. Yeah, and uh, you know with Viennese songs and stuff, which of course is very related to operetta. So we were living next to one of these places. It's one of these high again when I was a child. So I grew up with Viennese music from a very early age as well. Well, it's bound to get embedded in the brain, isn't it? And so, uh, just to clarify, you always stuck with the piano. You never dabbled with any other instruments at all at any stage. No, I played the violin later when I was okay. about. When we moved to London, that must have been 1980, so I was about nine or ten. Yeah. The perfect age to start the violin. That's when I started when I was nine. Um, uh, you know, I thought it was a perfect age. I mean, a lot of people start a lot earlier. Um, just going on, most of the conductors I've talked to have gone to university or music college or whatever and studied music, but you didn't. Um, you went and studied French and English law at King's College in London. Uh, what, did you, at the time have a choice between thinking about being a musician or wanting to be a lawyer? Well, what happened was that I was at, I was in school in, in high school and um, I loved playing the piano and I was, I was, I was, I was okay, I guess, but um, I didn't think I had the time to become a musician, a professional musician. And then um, <laughs> this was 1989. And this was actually the, the year that the, the film uh, Dead Poets Society came out. I don't know <laughs> if you've seen that movie. Yes, yeah. and, um, and it was pretty much, I was in a boarding school and it was pretty much very similar to my situation. I mean, not quite, of course, not that dramatic, but my father wanted me to study law and, and I wanted to become a musician. And um, yeah, and then I wasn't really, I wouldn't say I wasn't given a choice. He convinced me to study law. And then I studied a year of law and I really hated it. <laughs> um, and um, then I, my parents were living in Vienna at the time and I had a, I had a piano teacher, piano professor. Who, who thought I was, you know, talented and, and said, look, I'll prepare you for the entrance exam to get into conducting school. Yeah. It was clear that I wasn't going to become a classical pianist. I wasn't, I wasn't good enough. Uh, and so, so I, I, I quit law. I took a sabbatical from law and started uh, studying to prepare this entrance exam. And lo and behold, after a year of preparing it, I, I got in and, um, yeah, started studying conducting in Vienna. So when, at what point do you think conducting entered your head as a thought uh, of a potential career uh, 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 in the future. Um, 
I mean, mine, it didn't really pop into my head until I was a member of the CBSO and, and was playing in the orchestra and then thought, I wonder what these guys are doing in front of me and how it's impacting my life. But you, how did it first, or when did it first come into your brain? Um, I must say, when I was a child, we went to the opera a lot and <clears throat> my parents always bought seats in the box. So they sat at the back of the box, so it was cheaper. And they put me in the front of the box and on the side where we could always look at, and I was always looking at the conductor. <laughs> but I guess from that age, I was always fascinated by the conductor. Yeah. Um, and so I guess I just took it from there, yeah. And kind of more and more, I was always more and more interested in, in, the, in conducting. Yeah. So uh, I read, uh, using the usual roots of Wikipedia and your agent's biographies, uh, that you studied piano at the Vienna Academy and then on to the Vienna Conservatory to study conducting. Who were you studying with um, uh, when you were studying at the Vienna Conservatory? I was with, uh, had two professors. One was called Reinhard Schwarz and the other one was Georg Mark. And were they, to use a golfing term, ham and egging it um, between, you know, stick technique and score study? Um, were they two vastly different teachers? What, what were their approaches like? Because I'm pretty sure uh, now this is episode 83 or so. Those two names have not come up in, pre in any of the previous episodes. What were their teaching styles like? Well, Reinhard Schwartz used to be an assistant to Herbert von Karajan. Oh, um, so yeah, so we sort of got very much this kind of very uh, Kapellmeister, very classic German school, which was very, very good as a base. Yeah. And Georg Mark, uh, uh, Reinhard Schwarz died a few years ago, but uh, Georg Mark is still, still, uh, he's uh, he doesn't teach anymore, but he's still, still very much a good friend of mine at this point, and like a father figure to me. He, he was, um, he was a protege, actually, of Vladimir Fedoseyev. Mm -hmm. So he had a totally different approach to, to things. And they were very different, I must say. Um, I think the main thing that he taught me is you get to a point, you have to get to a point where you can teach yourself as a conductor. Mm -hmm. In other words, you have to get to a point where you can understand what you're doing and what's good and what's bad. You have to know what's bad. That's more important than knowing yeah, what's good. Yeah, what's good, yeah. you should just not even think about. But knowing what you did, you think, oh God, this was just terrible. What, what I'm doing here is terrible. Mm. And you have to know how to react, how to change that as quickly as possible without embarrassing yourself or embarrassing yourself to the least possible degree. Yes. And that's the secret. <laughs> and if you get to the point where you, you know, you know, okay, this is not good. And then you can just change it and do it differently. Uh, I think you've, you've kind of, and that takes many, 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 many years. Of course, you have to have a basic technique and all this stuff. I, I found that a lot. The most, one of the, apart from studying conducting at the conservatory, which was tremendous, the, the main thing where I really learned was watching conductors of the opera. Yeah, yeah. Because you'd often, I, I used to go at least three times a week, and I used to always get standing room and stand at the, on the side where you could look in, just look at the conductor, basically. You could hardly see the stage. Mm. And it was very interesting to see certain conductors with the same pieces who they just messed up. I mean, you know, you know, it's not the Vienna Staatsoper does not have only great conductors. Believe no. me, they have very, always very, some very, very, you know, average ones. And of course, of course, they have to work under very difficult conditions. Uh, they have no rehearsals often. But you'll see there were certain ones. Um, um, for, for me, one of the greatest ones was Fabio Luizia. I always learned so much from Fabio because he, he, he could just come with, no, obviously he had no rehearsal, and he could just get it together. He breathed so beautifully with the singers. Mm. He always got the right organic tempos and it just always worked with him. And then there'll be other colleagues whose names I won't mention, and it was just always a mess and it didn't really work. Of course, the public hardly noticed this, but of course I was staring at the conductor the whole evening and I could see exactly everything he did and how, you know, why what he did, well, he at that time there weren't were hardly any women conducting it in the opera. Um, so <clears throat> I could see what the conductor was doing and how uh, that impacted the performance. And that, was, that was very interesting. I learned a lot from that actually. Well, it's something that's come up before, and I'm, it's probably maybe something because you've conducted an awful lot of opera that you've done. It's this thing where you go in and literally with no rehearsal, I mean, you might speak to a couple of the main title role singers beforehand, and maybe a meeting with the concertmaster or the leader, but at no rehearsal, you just go in and conduct a piece of repertoire. And uh, as you say, you know, some people will fall foul of that and others will probably make their name and be asked back to do a production. What's it like? 
um, jumping forward to your own career when you have to go and do that? Yeah, I've always been used to doing that. I've done that since I started. Um, my first job was in Baden and uh, in next to Vienna, I was uh, doing, well, we only did, they only did operetta there actually. And I used to take over performances without rehearsal. Now, of course, I had the advantage of having been involved in the rehearsals by, you know, I was coaching them and coaching the production and uh, I knew the singers and I knew the show. So it was, it was actually not so difficult. Um, but then later on, you, you go on and you take over more difficult shows. Like I remember once I had to take over Falstaff with no rehearsal and I'd never, ever done the piece before. <laughs> and then it starts getting challenging, you know, because mm. you're doing it for the first time and you have no rehearsal. I mean, those are extreme situations. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. You just have to relearn the piece well and... Uh, and really, really see what the other conductor is doing. So, of course, if you can see what uh, this was in Dusseldorf many years later. So, I mean, I took over from John Fiore, who used to be my boss, and he knew, knows the piece inside out. So, I used to, you know, you go watch a few performances and then you, you see exactly what he's doing and then you take over. So, mm. it's, it's fine. If you're taking over from, I remember once I had to do a, a production of Wiener Blut to the Folks Opera in 1999, and I'd never done the piece before. And it was the opening of the season under a new director, and I'd never done the piece before, and I had no rehearsal. <laughs> now, there I didn't sleep the whole night. That was, <laughs> I mean, I prepared it very well, and I have a certain experience in operetta, but you're still pretty, pretty nervous. And at that time, the Folks Opera was, um, it, you know, I, it was a very important house for me, a big house for me at the time. I never, it was the biggest house I'd ever conducted in. So, it was quite nerve wracking, honestly. But you, you have to have a, a very um, organic way of conducting, yeah. and you have to understand singers, and you have to know the pieces very well. Mm. And uh, if you know, if you've done the pieces many, many, many times, it's fine. I mean, there could be a few things that don't quite work out, but basically, if you conduct, if you know the pieces very, very well and conduct them many times, you know where the corners are, mm. and you know where you really have to pay attention. And it helps if you've seen what the other conductors have done before you, so you know what you're going to diff do differently and when you really have to be hands-on to really steer it in a different direction, so to speak. Yeah. <clears throat> because, you know, the orchestra might go, kind of go on the automatic pilot thing. So if you don't bother them, they'll just play. Yes. But if you know you want to do this differently and do a different tempo, a different whatever, you've got to, you've got to know beforehand what the other person has done. So. Yeah, it's, it's difficult, isn't it, when you get into that into a situation where you've got an autopilot sort of happening. I remember, you know, uh, the first time I conducted the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and I was doing Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony and about a hundred bars into the performance, I was bored of the performance and I was conducting it because the, 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 I was getting the sort of their standard Jike Four. And so I thought, right, I'm, I'm going to change this. Uh, and immediately grabbed hold of a few pr uh, wind principles and the timpanist and just affected a few tempo changes. And you could feel the orchestra come up out of their music stands and go, oh, we're doing something different tonight, you know. But Yeah, they all woke up, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. all wake up. Yeah. yeah. Well, if I mean, I, that's that's the danger, isn't it? Yeah. If I feel the orchestra going automatic, I will immediately grab them and say, okay, no, no. And I just do something slightly different and make sure I get them. Yeah. Even if it means it's slightly getting a little wonky for a while, not a while, but like a couple of months, yeah. I make sure they know, okay, don't, don't play automatic. <laughs> don't, you know, don't go off on the tangent here. We're doing this together. So yeah, you've got to always be in charge, yeah. Going all the way back to you watching from the side at the Vienna Staatsoper, um, before I, I interview somebody who I never played for, I played for, as you can imagine, hundreds of conductors, but I never played for you, Alex. So I, I went online and I actually, I watched you conduct the Eroica Symphony this morning. And, um, and yeah. it was incredibly clear, wonderful performance. And what I got from that and what you were talking about there is that you need a clarity of technique and a fluidity of technique and the ability to control people under those circumstances. And that comes shining through. Um, uh, was that something you consciously thought of but why, by watching the good ones, Fabio Luisi, and the uh, unmentioned bad ones, thinking, well, I need to be clearer than them. I need to show exactly what my intentions are. Yeah, I think that the most important thing, the basic, the, the basis of a, of a good performance is the, is the, is the tempo. I know it sounds really stupid and, and <laughs> it's, it's like a no brainer, but, it's, but not, not only the, temp, the general tempo of the whole piece, but the, the tempo in every bar and the breathing and the structure and the rubato. And of course, in opera, 
you I mean in symphonic works it's not that pronounced let's put it that way no because you you know it's 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 it goes more in one tempo basically and also with an orchestra you can kind of do any tempo you want not any tempo you want but within a reason you can do it a bit fast a bit slow it's going to work if it's mm. relatively organic with an opera you're to, you're talking about millions of tempo changes in a, well not millions but you know hundreds of, or thousands of even thousands of tempo small very small tempo changes within in the whole performance and it will also depend on the singers on the piece on the orchestra on God knows what. Um, <laughs> so there's so many other things to consider. And it's a whole, it's a very, very, it's very difficult to get it just right. Mm. And the funny thing is there's so many pieces now, well, not so many, but there's a few, let's say five or six or seven pieces that I've done many, 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 many times, like over a hundred times. So it's, you know, like Rigoletto, Traviata, Bohème, Butterfly, Tosca. I've done literally on average a hundred times each. Wow. And it's interesting because I've done it for, for, for about 20 years. So, and it's because I always get to do these pieces on Carmen as well. And it's funny because you think, okay, I know this now, it's fine. And every time I do it, there's some tiny little detail. I go, you know what? If I did it like this, it's going to be just slightly better even. And you yeah. and you get really annoyed every time you, you go, oh no, it's, there's, there's more to, oh no, I still don't know it really. <laughs> well, you know it, but you know, there's always some little detail that you'll find to make it, you know, even more organic. And and, and so it's, it's quite, mm. you know, quite interesting. In that sense. It is, absolutely. Um, I, it's come up in the past on this podcast a couple of times, and I'm going to ask you whether you agree with what Kevin John Edusay said about the Kapellmeister system. He said it's brutal um, because of the amount of work that you have to do, the amount of assisting and then taking over of, um, you know, I can list the places you've worked at, Nuremberg, baden by Wien, Klagenfurt, Vienna Volksoper, before you get the first Kapellmeister job at the Deutsche Oper am Rhein. Um, what is it like? What 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 is the the whole living in the Kapellmeister system like? I mean, I said to him, and I've said to the others who are in it, you sort of appear later on, out of nowhere, as if a, a magically formed conductor has appeared in their late thirties or whatever, because you've just dip, been disappeared and sort of sucked into this system. What what is it like? Well, the the thing is, I think it's the only real system that works, in my opinion. To- to, to really form a proper conductor or proper opera conductor. Yeah. I think you've got to first of all separate between symphonic and, and opera conductor because they are quite different things, actually. Yes. I mean, of course, a, a, a good conductor can conduct both, um, but it's very, very difficult to... There comes a point where when you get to a certain point in your, your career, and we talk at a very, very high level, to do both at a very, very high level. I'm talking the best possible level. It's almost impossible because they require different things. Yeah. Um, which would take me forever now to explain what the differences are, but I mean, the, 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 the opera is actually much more difficult than symphonic works. Yes. I think most people agree on that. But symphonic has a different challenge. You've got to be a different type. You've got to be a, you've got only a few days and you've got to make an impression very, very quickly. You'll have, I mean, usually you have, let's say, two and a half days to make an impression that's the concert, right? On average. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes yeah, yeah. you have three, four days, but you've, got, you've usually got, if you're lucky, you, if you're unlucky, you have two rehearsals. If you're lucky, you have five rehearsals with mm. the dress rehearsal. Let's say something between those, and it's usually done in two to three days, maybe four if you're lucky. Um, and you have to make a very, you have to go in there full power and 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 convince the orchestra. So you've got to be very determined, and you've got to know exactly what you want. There's no there's no room for for error in the rehearsals. There's no yeah. if you lose the orchestra in ten minutes of a rehearsal, you've pretty much had it. You can have a bad 10 minutes and you're finished. They will hate you forever. Whereas if you do an opera for six weeks and you've had a bad 10 minutes somewhere along the line and then the rest is fine, you have, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it was a bad day. You move on. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But so, so it's got a different form of pressure uh, conducting symphonic works and you have to be very, very organized in your rehearsals because you only have that short amount of time. But you have the advantage that you have a, a fixed pass in the orchestra and you and you can ask for every single tiny little detail you want. In fact, you mm-hmm. should. With, with opera, there's no point because usually in the general system, they change the orchestra's changing all the time. So if you start talking about a certain sound you want, and then and then the next day is there's three different wind players, as it was a complete waste of time. So you have to know how to work in a totally different manner. I mean, of course, in England, it's not the case. You have the same orchestra. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When I worked in England and wherever Wales and, and, and London, it's 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 just a fixed orchestra. So you have to know how. <clears throat> how to deal with these two different concepts. Um, 
the Kapellmeister system is great because you learn how to, you, you coach singers, you learn the psychology of singers, you learn what it is to, I, when I was in Baden, I had to do everything. I had to, I had to coach singers. I had to coach, play, I had to even play ballet rehearsals. <laughs> Not many, there was a ballet pianist, but every now and then when he had a day off, I would go in and coach the ballet and play them, you know, slowly their dance moves. And, and you get a really good feeling of tempo and rhythm. Yes. Because you have to be so rhythmic, you know, you have to be like, you know, like a metronome for the mm. dancers. So it's it's kind of a training. And then, of course, I had to do the chorus rehearsals from the piano and, and, and study the whole chorus. And you learn what it's like to work with the chorus, which is a very tiring job, actually, to be honest. Yep. It's very demanding psychologically, motivate to how to motivate the chorus, keep them interested, not getting kind of keep them you know it you you learn you learn a lot and of course when you work in smaller houses where you don't have um perhaps the greatest quality sometimes it's just normal you sometimes don't have the greatest quality in, in big houses by the way so it's not it's not only in the small house in fact sometimes you have better cast in the smaller houses than in the big houses i've, I've experienced that as well uh, without mentioning any names so you know that all is all it's all possible but um you you learn you learn a lot and I think uh, to become a good opera conductor, you have to have gone through the system. Mm. Uh, and there's many famous concert conductors, very famous concert conductors, and everybody in the business knows they're actually not really good opera conductors. I mean, they get to conduct in all the big houses and they get great singers and great orchestras, so it sort of works. But they don't really know how to quite get the time with the singers and breathe the singers and get the right sense of drum because they haven't got the experience and they haven't really got the fun in it. Mm. So um, I'm very glad I, I was one of this generation that still went through the system. Nowadays, this is not really in demand. If you want to make a career as a conductor nowadays, it's a waste of time. Mm. Because to make a career doesn't mean you have to um, get this fundament. To make a career now, you have to conduct Mahler symphonies and Shostakovich symphonies. <laughs> That's the trick. You, you get a good agent, Get Mark, get Shostakovich, jump around a lot, and make lots of extreme effects, and you're fine. That's basically <laughs> the secret. Well, it's I've, true. It's true. I, I've said it on this Again, podcast. I'm one of these. Thing. I'm one of these conductors who, uh, who I, I hate the dance move um, conducting that seems to be the latest yeah, fad. Yeah. You know, my dance moves will fit to whatever you perform, yeah. rather than actually learning to fix problems and and also conduct in the moment when you when you're needed and when you're not needed. When to just sit and enjoy the ride on the horse? Right, yeah. When to hold the reins and pull the reins and yeah. maybe tap the back of the head with a whip? You know, th that's what real conducting is for me, rather than you know a sort that's of right. choreography. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if they, I mean, if the thing, the, the thing, the problem with that is though, I completely agree with you. By the way, I'm the first one to let things go when they go. Mm. The problem is, you're going to have two types of orchestras. It gets very complicated because you'll have some orchestras who go, "Oh, he's so controlling. He doesn't trust us. I wish he'd let us play. He's yeah. just a control freak, and and he's he's terrible. It's so cramped. He doesn't doesn't make feel the music and let us trust us. And then and then and then the others will say. The guy doesn't control us at all. He's like, he's just, he's just not even there. Yeah. <laughs> What's he yeah. doing? He, he, he just, he's just letting us play and we don't need him. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you can, if you, the, the auctions often will always find a way to not yes. be happy. So, well, not, I'm not saying that. Actually, you'll have different auctions who want different things. Some auctions will want you to let them play and the auctions, other auctions will want them, you to have a, a firm grip. And mm. it will also be a question of personality. Some auctions like, you know, conductors are very, very strict and very sort of cold, I don't want to say cold in a negative way, but very technical and very bang, 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 we do this, we do this, we do this, that shows authority. Yeah. Others hate that and find that arrogant and want people as just a kind of a colleague who can charm them. Yeah. And so collaborate. And, and, you, yeah. can't, and yeah. you know, it, you find, I find if I have a certain way of being and I find that some officers just don't like that. And I go, okay, fine, you, you want this type, I'm not that type, I'm this type. So, and it's yeah. very interesting, you go with the same piece to different officers and they'll, some people will like it and some people just don't, just because of your personality. So mm. it's very, very interesting. Yeah, but you, as you get older, you learn that. Yes. I've even used the horse analogy in front of an orchestra at times and said, look, we're both here to enjoy that. You're, you know, you're the horse. You're in, here to enjoy the run through the fields and the forest. But occasionally I have to stop you chasing after rabbits. You know, that's part, part of my job, you know, is to always to help you jump over that fence. You know, without me, sometimes you're going to crash or run into a tree. So, you know, let me help you. Um uh, but yeah, I've one and actually, what's interesting about that—that that was a question. I, uh, the difference between conducting and dealing with 
the time differences between six weeks of opera and three days of symphonic was a question I was going to ask much later, but you've d- you, you wonderful answer. Uh, we're going to go to something else now, which has popped up in the podcast, which is being a, a gay MD or a general music director. And you were general music director for seven years yeah. uh, of the Staats Theater Braunschweig, uh, also the Staats Orchestra Braunschweig. How did you find it? Previous gay MDs days have yeah. said, uh, one in particular, Jack Van Steen said he hated it because uh, he spent 75% of his time in meetings and only 25% of the time actually conducting opera, um, whereas Kirill Karabitz was more sort of 50-50 about it. Um, what, how did you find it? Did, were you embroiled in meetings about the, the music for the city and all of that, or did you get away with less of that and actually conduct more? Well, I managed to do both. I didn't. I, I was very lucky. I had a very, very good right-hand man who was the the orchestra director, who was also actually the solo trumpet player of the orchestra, and he was fantastic. And we were very uh, efficient in the way we worked. So I would make one phone call to him and say, "Okay, let's do this," and we discuss things. Or he'd call me and ask for this, and we just discuss it, and it was done. And then yeah. it would just happen. Um, what I find a lot with administrative stuff is that you often have, forgive me for saying this, but directors who want to have endless meetings so that they can feel important. <laughs> well, it's actually all you have to do is make a decision. Yeah. You know, you just have to make a decision. I mean, there's certain things that need to be discussed, but, you know, with the programming, I, I programmed the, the I pro, me and Martin Bella, the orchestra director, programmed the, the symphonic stuff. But that was pretty easy. You know, what's the big mm. deal? You say, OK, we'll do that. You know, you always do some of the, you know, good old war horses, the Beethoven and Brahms and Brookner and Mahler symphonies. Like everybody else in the world does, you do a few unknown things. You'll do a couple of modern things. New Year's concert with some, you know, I mean, it's not... Yeah. Uh, rocket science you know and then you'll and then you'll find out okay it's Schubert year so we'll do Schubert you know I mean it's it's it just you just have to discuss it and listen look for a few things and find a few interesting soloists and 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 Bob's your uncle it's not that difficult really mm. uh, in the opera of course it's more complicated because then you have to deal with the choose the pieces and and cast them but I I like casting opera singers I I, I have a big a big big love for opera singers um and 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 voices. So I, I and I think I have quite a good ear for for opera singers. So I, I very much enjoyed that. And I'm somebody who, when I hear a good voice, I I, I will run after the singer and, and convince him to come. So, I mean, I discovered I, I don't want to show off, but I, I I was at the Domingo competition some many years ago, uh, in in Budapest, and and I heard this sensational baritone, who Turkish baritone called Orhan Yildiz. And I said, this guy's brilliant. And he sang a Bellini aria, which is unfortunate because you never win a prize when you sing a Bellini aria. <laughs> it's, it's almost impossible. He sang it fantastically, but of course the piece was a little bit, yeah. I wasn't going to say boring, but it, he sang it perfectly. But of course some tenor comes and sings on Yegin and Lensky and he's going to win. It yeah. doesn't really, it's, you know, it's, always a, it's also you win because of the repertoire you sing and not because of how you sing. That's another thing you have to learn. It's like as a conductor, you'll have a success conducting Shostakovich, but not really so much if you do a Salieri symphony. So, <laughs> to, you know, yeah. it depends on what you do to yeah. have a success, not how you actually do it. Yeah. <laughs> right? Well, if you conduct a Mahler symphony, you're going to pretty much always have a success unless you really are completely untalented. You know, and if you do a Haydn symphony, it's already harder to get a success. Anyway, so I, I saw this guy, I think it was great. He didn't win a prize, unfortunately. And I went up to him and I hired him for outside of branch and now and then he got a job he auditioned for the Wiener Staatsoper a couple of years later and he got a job there so there you go so I love I love I'm very proud when I discover singers you know who are not known yet so just kind of he was singing in in a town called Merzin somewhere in the middle of Turkey uh, middle no I don't want to say middle nowhere I don't want to sound offensive but you know a town that no one's really heard as an opera house and and uh, at least not outside of Turkey and you know he's, he's making a big career now so uh, you know, I, I liked um, I liked casting. That was fun, and you get you have certain advantages as well. Because as a music director, you can do all the good stuff. Yeah. You know, as a guest conductor, how often will you, are you going to really be offered to conduct the ring in <laughs> an opera house when there's a music director? No, you're not. You are not going to do the ring, and you won't be conducting Strauss and Wagner operas because that's what the music director does. Yeah. Again, yeah. because that's where you have the most success. That's why they always do that. <laughs> so I got to finally do Spalomé, 
and Lewin Green and Tristan and Parsifal and all these kind of pieces, which is, was, was a tremendous experience. And of course, in the symphonic work uh, world, I managed to, because I hadn't conducted that much symphonic stuff up till then, I mean, relatively speaking, so I managed to pretty much cover most of the symphonic, you know, main stuff in the symphonic mm. world. So that was, that was great. Um, you always have to make compromises as a music director, but it's, 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 it was fun. I enjoyed it. When you heard these voices, be it a competition or whatever else, maybe a broadcast when you're driving in the car, did you immediately think, I want that voice to sing that particular piece? and then program it? Or did you think, I love that voice, I, and uh, I'm going to cast them in something next year? How specific were you about the voices that you heard and discovered? Well, what we did was we found a few tremendous singers for Braunschweig. As I said, a couple of them, and this is just one example. We had another girl called Liana Alexanian, who now has sang at the Scala, Madame Butterfly, you know, and she came from Braunschweig. Well, she went to Essen after that and then went to, now she's in Dusseldorf and she's a tremendous singer. Uh, and she was supposed to sing Aida at the Royal Opera House. So, you know, I'm very proud of these kind of singers. And so someone like Liana, uh, we, we would say, okay, we've got a tremendous singer in the house. We would cast operas for her. Mm. So she's a sort of heavy lyric soprano. Well, sort of, at that time she was middle heavy, sort of like a Tatiana kind of thing. And then later on she sang. And she sang Mimi and these kind of roles, sort of, sort of, sort of classic lyric. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, so we programmed pieces for her. Uh, and then and we had, a, we had some really good singers. And we, we just said, okay, you know, we, if we, we have this and this singer, we can cast, do cast these operas. Yes, we definitely did that as well. And on the other hand, I was very strict with my singers. And Leanna wanted to sing, uh, what was it, when you were doing Madame Butterfly, and she wanted to sing Butterfly. This was at the time when the voice wasn't quite ready for you. And I, I didn't let her sing it. I, I refused and she was very upset with me, but uh, it was the right thing to do because she, the mm. voice wasn't there yet and she would have hurt herself. So uh, she sang it later, but she was, you know, too young at that point. This, the voice wasn't quite ready yet. So you have to know how to cast and not cast too early singers for roles because you'll, you'll hurt them, but that's, yes. that's known. Unfortunately, most, most people don't understand that these days. So. <laughs> yeah. um, I always ask, every conductor this next question you, uh, and you will be no different when you come to learn a new score uh, and it could be uh, an opera or a symphonic project do you have a system for learning it do you in your case because you play the piano uh, use a piano for learning a score and when you come to learn your score are you a scribbler in of things uh, do you write lots of things in your scores uh, colors um, all sorts of things what's your what's your process for learning a score well, I do. I play on the piano. I do three three basic things. Well, there's four things. The first thing is I play on the piano. Second thing is I analyze it very mm -hmm. in every single detail that I can. I read about the music and how it was composed and all that stuff. Find literature about it if it's a thing that's more complicated, like say, like an example would be a Mahler symphony. I don't know if, how much you experience it with Mahler, but they're very complicated, and you have, you know, different experts on Marlowe giving you a different analysis of what the structure is. I mean, it, you know, usually you can analyze any piece pretty straight, it's pretty straightforward. And then with Marlowe, it starts getting very ambiguous. So you, you have to, and then you start, it, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. Uh, so, so I'll do that. Then I'll, so then I'll, I'll really will structure it, which is, a, which is of course a bar analysis. Uh, I mean, a big analysis of the big form which in most cases, no problem. As I said, Marlowe is an example where it's not so obvious in, in yeah. some cases, in many yeah. cases. I mean, Marla 10, for instance, what's, what's yeah. that? What structure is that? You can see it three different ways. Uh, and then I will, I will use colors, but only for the bars. So if you have periods of, let's say, 16 bars, which is a classic standard kind of period or 14, I'll put a blue line. Yeah. And when you get to a, you know, a bigger period, like, say, a recapitulation or the beginning of a... A new period, a new a new section, a development section, or or a code. I'll put a red line, so that I just do that, and I'll put on top the the number of bars at the beginning of this thing. Okay, this is a sixteen bar period. It's I don't know eight plus four plus four or whatever. Yeah. I, but then I was very interesting because I studied I studied Wagner, I did the whole ring. I did a lot of Wagner operas now, uh, 
And that gets more complicated because first of all, the bar analysis is more complicated and the big structure is much, much more complicated. And you have all the motifs and, yeah. you, and, the, and you have, you know, I don't know if you've ever done a, a Wagner opera, but you've got the, you've got a very big form and, it's, and, and within it, it's like a, a, a it's like one of well, these Russian dolls. So oh, you yes, have a very yeah. small form, like two plus two plus four. You know, it's usually an A, A, B form. So you've got an A. We well, Usually it's, you know, you, you the struck classic form is A, B, A, right? Normally. But of course, Wagner's most of the time A, A, B, not always, but often. Not always, but like, let's say 60, 70%. But of course, then you have, but then this, this mini structure will be within another A, A, B thing. So you've got an A, A, B, and then you have another A, prime AAB and then you'll have a big B which is a mixture of everything and and then you'll have another thing and it's it's very complicated you know so so I I do write everything and so with the, the Wagner was, was really I, when I did the ring I almost went nuts because I, I had to do the whole thing in the season so I had to actually study I studied the, I had two years to study it so I studied in about nine months well the basic analysis which is how long it took me so you have to write so you because it's actually quite good to study to say, okay I'm going to start and then you just keep going until you're finished, which is yes. takes forever. It's three and a half thousand pages. But you <laughs> it's only the problem is to remember all the motifs that go through all the operas. You, it's good to do that because if you wait a year and you've forgotten what is this motif? I think I saw it somewhere in Rheingold and you're doing yeah. you go to Denmark and you can't remember anymore. So it's quite good to just start. I had one season where I didn't have well, I had stuff to do, but it was stuff, you know, I had a lot of repertoire performances of of Magic Flute at the time. So I was sort of free between the shows and I was just studying the the ring and I got, I sort of got, got through it. Um, it's very, very complicated, I must say. So you feel once you've managed to study that, you feel you can study anything actually yeah. after that. <laughs> I bet. It was, it was very interesting though. I learned a lot, learned, I learned a lot studying it. You, you see other structures in a different way. That's interesting. Um, one final question, because you seem to study so intently. Uh, you were talking about uh, looking at maybe the histor history of when the music was written. But do you also, at any point in this process, listen to recordings? Uh, some conductors yes, do. Yes, of course. Most, con most conductors anybody, do. Yeah. As can, any conductor says, oh, I don't listen to recordings, they're lying. They're all <laughs> like, everybody listens to recordings. Everybody. Yeah. Don't tell me you don't listen to recordings. Everybody listens to recordings, and it's very healthy. I, you mustn't just listen to one. I oh, like listening to yeah. all kinds of recordings. It's so interesting, and 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 after a while, you get to listen to ones. You go, oh, I like that one. It's, it's often the same conductor. You go, oh, it's, yeah, I like this guy. <laughs> you yeah. get a you get a, a feeling for 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 yeah. It, it's very very interesting, and 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 you also because a lot of because if you're at a certain level. I don't want to say that I'm at that level, but you, you get try to attain a certain level of conducting. If you listen very caref very carefully to recording, especially opera, I mean, some point, like I said, you can do any tempo, not any tempo, but the tempo within reason that an orchestra can play. But um, <clears throat> with opera, if you listen very, very carefully to the recordings, you will hear when the tempo is not quite right for the singers. Yes. And, you, and you will understand why. So it's very mm. interesting to hear, ah, this is, let me see, ah, the singer can't breathe there. Ah, you can feel how the singer wants to push the tempo there and the conductor's behind the singer, which mm -hmm. if you've ever been in a pit, you know that feeling. You go, oh, I should be a little faster here. The singer needs to move forward because he's not getting through the phrase. Yeah. And, and so if you listen to all these recordings, you can minimize the mistakes that you're going to do later on when you do the opera for the first time. I'm not saying you're gonna stop them completely because you'll also not quite get it right the first time. No, I don't think anybody does. Hmm. Um, but it, it is a big help, yeah. So it's very interesting to listen to the recordings. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Brilliant, I'm glad you said that because uh, a few people, uh, very occasionally somebody said they, ne they never listen to recordings on the podcast. Most people say they do. Normally early on in the process or maybe after they've marked up and learned their score, they might then dip into a few recordings or whatever. But everybody, I think everybody should. I think you'd be stupid not to listen to the greatest conductors on the planet who've put these things down on record. Why would you ignore them? Um, and I, and uh, I've never said that I think that the people who say that they don't listen to recordings are liars, but <laughs> you said it and now I can. So I I think, yeah, I think you're right. They are liars. I, they, you can tell them from me, best regards from Alex, you're lying. Everybody listens to recordings. They, they just have an agent says, just, just so you have a list of recordings. You're just the genius who looks at the score and you imagine it perfectly and you come and conduct it perfectly. Nobody does that. Give me a break. <laughs> it's just a lie. <laughs>
If you're fascinated by how a score is marked up, I've written an article on the subject showing my own method and explaining how I go about the process of marking and learning a score. You can see this article, as well as other articles, bonus mini-episodes, interviews and videos, by subscribing from just £5 a month to my Patreon page. If you decide to pay annually, you can even get a 10% discount over the year and join the discussion all about conductors and conducting at a discounted rate. This is quite a saving if you choose to pay for the highest subscription rate, which includes conducting lessons from myself as part of that package. The details are in the show notes attached to this episode, and it'd be great to have more of you subscribing to this ever-growing supporters club. Now, back to my chat with Alexander Joel and the all-important 10 questions. Alex, it's the moment everybody loves. It's the 10 questions, and you will start with the same two questions I always start with. What sound or noise do you love, and what sound or noise do you hate? What do I love? Um... A beautiful string sound from a Viennese orchestra. Hmm. What I hate, out-of-tune oboe. <laughs> yeah. That, no, the oboe is just slightly over the hill. I can't really play anymore. You know, just one of those per people. It just, it's just really awful. Just, isn't it, isn't it a, yeah. a sound? Uh, no, no, don't be sorry. Isn't it a sound that... You know, it's it's I it's the nearest I can equate to a singer that's just going starting. You know, to go down the wrong. Oh, side Oh, that's the, a good one too. Yeah. You're right. Uh, 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 yeah, a singer who's really really over the hill and sings flat. That that's actually worse than an oboist who's who's <laughs> who's, who's uh, he can't play anymore. And a terrible singer who's flat. That just drives me up the wall. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. If you had twenty four hours free, what would you spend it doing? Uh, I would. I have a. I have a beautiful place on a lake in Austria, and I would just go there and spend my time there. Yeah, look at the lake and cook good food and have a glass of wine. Are you a in the lake swimming person or on the lake boating person or neither? Or are you just sitting on the side looking at the lake person? No, I love swimming as well. Yeah. Great. I'm not jealous at all, honest, <laughs> having a lakeside place <laughs> in Austria. That sounds terrible. <laughs> uh, the next one, uh, you can have as many as you like. Who would be a favourite conductor of yesteryear? Well, that's what everybody else says, which is Kleiber. <laughs> You're right. Not everybody said everybody it. Everybody else. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he, you know, his name comes up uh, possibly two episodes out of three. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm. But I love Carrion as well. Carrion was a fantastic conductor. Um, really brilliant. Yeah. So, but there are many, many, many who are great. You know, it's yeah. not just Cliver. Cliver was unique, of course. Yes, he was. Um, well, let's go on and find out who your favourite current conductors might be. Uh, well, for opera, it's definitely Tony Papano. Without mm. any question, I think he's brilliant. I, I love Tony. I think he's incredible. He's one of the nicest people I've ever met uh, in the business, and um, I really look up to him and admire him. And um, I love Daniele Gatti as well for symphonic stuff. I think mm. he's he's absolutely fa fabulous. Well, I would personally agree with you completely about Tony Papano. Uh, he's been on this podcast, and it was the first time I'd ever met him via a Zoom call, and he was the loveliest man I could ever wish to speak with. And we had a wonderful chat, and once I'd pressed stop on the record button, we just carried on chatting. Lovely, lovely man. And I agree with you. I, I've enjoyed virtually yeah. everything he's ever put down on record, or I've seen him do uh, in the Opera House. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's astounding. He's really one of the nicest people I've ever met in the business. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant chap. Yeah, lovely guy. What is the hardest work you've ever conducted? Rosenkavalier. And why would that be? Because it's, a, it's, incredible, it's of incredible complexity, which a lot of Strauss is. I mean, the, the, the density of the piece is, is incredible. And the effort has to sound completely natural and flowing. And as if it's just some little Viennese waltz kind of thing. And, it, and at the same time, it's so complicated. You can hardly, yeah, master. So, so I did that. And I, I, when I started studying the score and I finally finished it, I, thought, I didn't think I could manage it. It's, it's very difficult. Yeah. Very, very difficult. 
I have to be honest yet again, dear listeners, uh, I assisted Andrus Nelsons on three operas when he was music director of the CBSO. He did Lohengrin, Tristan in Isolde and Rosencavalier and I assisted him. For the two Wagner operas, I was desperate to have a go and to be let up and let and so he could go out and listen. When it came to Rosencavalier, I was desperate for him to not give me a go because I found it incredibly difficult myself. And especially if it got anywhere near the waltzes, which are just so... Uh, it's. I've, I have conducted the, the Rosencavalier suite since and enjoyed it greatly, but, I mean, that's nothing compared to the whole opera. So, you know, Alex is nodding away um, on the screen. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's a toughie, isn't it? It really is. Yeah, yeah, especially, I mean, the waltzes are not that even that bad. As, as you said, when you do the suite, it's not a problem. The problem is when you get to the singers, it's so complicated uh, to keep uh, it together. And the second act, as well, especially, is, it's really difficult. It just really is. But, yeah. <laughs> Any plans to do it again soon? Uh, no, unfortunately not. No, no oh, well, oh, well, that's a good answer. Unfortunately not, which means that you're quite willing to get back on that horse and have another go. Well, that's good. Uh, most conductors say the same thing about the hardest work they've ever conducted. They'd love another go at it. When travelling abroad to conduct, what item could you not leave home without? Uh, my pillow. Oh, you're another one who takes a pillow. I have a small pillow. Mm. I have a pillow, which is sort of like a little hard pillow so I can sleep at night. But it gets it, it, the thing is I could if you I could elaborate on the answer. I also have I often travel. I have a Brompton bicycle. Oh wow! And they're fantastic. So if I'm spending six, if I have six weeks in a town, it's great to have a little bicycle to get around uh, it, because that means you don't have to get an apartment near the opera house. You can live a little bit further out and, and just cycle around, and it's brilliant to get around with the, the Brompton. And one year I went really crazy. I bought this incredible, this huge coffee machine. You know, these really big ones, you know, like where they do the espressos and the coffee, <laughs> you know, professional yeah. barista machines. And I got a grinder and, and I took a flight case, listen to this, a flight case and put the grinder and the coffee machine and all the stuff that goes with it. And it's like, it was like 100 and, 110 kilos. And I schlepped that around Europe on trains. <laughs> and so every apartment I was in, it was the year I did the ring. So every part was when I had my amazing coffee in the morning, amazing cappuccino. And then after one season of schlepping that around, I thought, this is a little bit ridiculous. And uh, <laughs> stopped doing that. But the, <laughs> but the Brompton <laughs> bike? Plane, <laughs> but the Brompton bike, you still do that? Because I think the that's Brompton a wonderful plane. idea. Yeah, yeah, you can. It is. It's really, really cool. And you can... What you can actually do is you don't need that much stuff apart from the bike. I mean, just get if you just have a few clothes and a score and 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 you know nothing major else, you can get these sort of soft shell suit not case but like bags. You mm -hmm. put the bike in and then you you put a suit bag, well a bag over the bike where you stuff your clothes in and that protects the bike and you can check that in and it weighs twenty three kilos yeah. and you can take it with you wherever you want. It's it's pretty it's it's pretty incredible. But it's it's worth it's worth having. Yeah, definitely. Well, the first time I saw one was uh, the core anglais player of the CBSO did exactly what you used to do, and he, he used to put it in his suitcase for long tours. Um, Pete Walden, hello, Pete, if you're if you're, and um, and uh, yeah, that was the first time I saw one. But then you know, people then took it even further. I know that I've heard of stories of people cycling to to start a tour, you know, cycling from the UK to get to the middle of Germany. You just think, well, that's taking it a little bit too far. <laughs> <laughs> but I know I've heard of people doing it. Um, well, when uh, we did the Salzburg Festival, we were there at the same time as the Halle. Apparently, a member of the Halle cycled all the way there. Uh, which, yeah, that's that's some dedication. Hopefully, they did. <laughs> it was Brompton. Yeah, uh, no, not with a Brompton. No, 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 with a with with Brompton. <laughs> No, no, uh, no, not on a Brompton. I think it was on a, another bike. Um, but I, hopefully, it was for charity because um, that they would have raised a few pounds. Um, <laughs> next one, number um, eight. Uh, and again, the, well, this can be real or fantasy, anything you like. What is the one thing you would change about being a conductor? I, you know what? I'll be honest with you. I think the biggest frustration I have about conducting is that outside of people in our business and maybe a few singers and orchestras, nobody knows if you're good or bad. And so it's very, very frustrating that you're not judged on your quality uh, or not quality is for that matter. So it, it, it's just got so ridiculous. So you just have people who can't conduct and who are making careers because of whatever, all kinds of other reasons. And, and on the other hand, you have other people uh, who are very good, who, who, who don't have the right image or the right this or haven't, don't get to conduct the right pieces. And that's very frustrating. I wish you could just, 
people could just judge you. The audience and critics and managers and the uh, artistic directors actually know what a good conductor is or what a bad one is. Mm. That's all I would like to change. So there would be more quality conductors uh, making, you know, who are up there conducting. And, and, and it's just there's too much, too much, I think, not, not enough good conductors who are conducting. And so, the, so, so, and then what happens is a lot of people who are very average conductors, they will, you know, as soon as they become music directors, someone, the first thing they will do is make sure that no one who's any good gets anywhere near their orchestra. They're always like bad people because they don't want to be seen as not as good. So if you could just get rid of, if you could just make it obvious who's good and who's bad, I don't know how that's possible. It's not possible, of course, because orchestras are so good these days and can play with bad conductors as well. And if people don't hear the difference and that's very, very frustrating. So that's mm. what I would like to change. I like, if you're good, you 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 make a career, and if you're bad, you get fired, and people hate you, and your manager says, "Oh, this guy's crap; it doesn't hire you." That's what I would want to change. I'm, I'm probably not the only person who said that as well, right? Uh, no, you're the first person who said that, actually. Um, and yeah, and, really? and I, yeah, okay. and I'm I'm going to put my 22 year hat on of being a, uh, 22 years as a violinist in the CBSO hat on, uh, so because I've been on both sides of the fence. And we used to evaluate our conductors um, originally on a sheet of paper, and then now it's probably all done digitally online. Because I think, you know, where people are judging conductors are on the concerts and on image and on PR and on... Whereas where the work really happens is in rehearsal, and we saw all of them, of course, rehearse. And the amount of times we would you know, fill out a form and say, this conductor's awful. And the answer would come back from the management when we had the meeting, but the concert was amazing. You said, well, yeah, they weren't making any sound. We were producing it. Um, and I think that's where the difficulty lies is the fact that the 98% of the work is done behind closed doors and the managers and the PR agents and all of these people don't get to see when the good conductors are being good, when they're actually rehearsing the orchestra and making them play better. Um, I think that's the difficult thing. They only get to see the shop window um, and sometimes the shop window's got nothing to do with what the conductor's done. Do you agree? Exactly. I completely agree. But that, that's what I was saying with symphonic work, symphonic work, because symphonic work, it really depends 90, say 95% on the rehearsals. Mm. Uh, and 5% is the show. I mean, once you've rehearsed it, it sort of just goes. With opera, it's different. Because yes. you know, often you won't have a rehearsal. Or you'll have, as a conductor, you'll have one rehearsal with a orchestra where there's different cast and you have one run through with the singers you know you can't start correcting the intonation in the woodwinds or one no. chord because there'll be different people sitting there anyway so it's a complete waste of time don't do it just don't touch it just go right over it if it's flat or wrong just let them get on with it it's not it's not your problem you don't have time to do that so then it will depend on how you conduct yes but then again you have to conduct at a very very high level to get it together with the, with, with the singers you have to be really on the top of your game technically and musically in an opera. Yeah. Symphonically, anybody can give an upbeat and it will play and, you know, and whatever. Not whatever, but it will sort of work. Mm. So that's, that's true. That's what I, that's again, it's the difference between symphonic and opera. It's the, the rehearsal process is a completely different one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you will get found out. And in opera, it will depend a lot on the singers you get. Yes. If, if you've got bad singers in opera, you can be Carlos Kleiber, you're, you've got a big problem because the orchestra will just not play well with bad singers. Because yeah. you've got an average orchestra and you have great singers and everyone's really listening, they, if you conduct halfway decently, they'll really play because they'll just, out of respect for the singer, they'll just want to accompany them. So it's, you know, that also has a role and that's also something critics don't understand. If you've got bad singers, it's not your fault really if the orchestra play terribly not terribly, not as well as if they would play with great singers. And yeah. so there's only so much, there's only, you're, you are sort of limited as a conductor with, with what you can really achieve in, in some ways, yeah. Number nine, and I think I know that it's not going to be lawyer. Uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Uh, you know, during the lockdown, um, I was sort of wanted obviously something else to do. Um, uh. So I, um, I, I, I started taking a carpentry course, actually. And uh, actually, my uncle's a carpenter, or used to be a carpenter. And I really, I really enjoy that. I think, it, let's put this way, if I was not a musician, um, well, let's put it this way, I'd rather be, I wouldn't want to be a music teacher. Mm. I mean, I wouldn't mind doing, I've done master classes for conducting, that's a different story. But I would definitely not want to be a music teacher. I'd rather not just do something for the else. But I would do something, I wouldn't do something administrative. I wouldn't become a lawyer or a banker or any of these things. 
I would, I mean, uh, uh, definitely maybe be a, a carpenter. I loved, I loved and really enjoyed doing some carpentry. And I built some things for my daughter and, and for the house we live in. I mean, for our apartment, some cupboards or whatever. I mean, very simple. I, you know, I can't do it really. But I, I, I would become a carpenter. Just released uh, this uh, this Sunday, but this Sunday uh, just gone was episode sixty six with Carlo Rizzi, and he gave exactly the same answer as you. He's got a little workshop in uh, oh. just by his house uh, so do I. in Italy, and yeah. so he got, when I asked him about what would you do in your days off, he said I, you know, I'd probably go for a walk around you know, near my house, and then I'd go to my little workshop and make something uh, in woodworking. Um, so yeah, opera conductors and woodworking. That's what I did. Go I, figure. Thought, I bought all yeah. this stuff. Uh, yeah, I bought all this stuff. I even bought a little outfit, you know, the, the, these working clothes and and, uh, and and then saws and electric this and, and screwdrivers or whatever. Yeah, I bought a whole a whole thing and I'm doing it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Great. Excellent. And finally, if the world were to end tonight, what would be your choice of final meal and drink? Well, I would go to uh, the best, French restaurant in Paris. And I went to one a few years, many years ago called Joël Rebuchon, who I, I don't think has, doesn't exist anymore now, but uh, that was such a spectacular meal that I, that's what I would do. It's, it's yeah. a pretty boring answer, I suppose, because it's kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> but I love cooking myself, but I'd rather have somebody, you know, if it's the last meal, I might as well spend the last money you have on that meal, I suppose. <laughs> um, and I'm assuming yeah. you would have the uh, accompanying wine flight that is suggested for the taster menu, or would you go a la carte and choose your own wine? I th- I'll just take whatever they give me. It's probably <laughs> the sort of restaurant I would be thinking of. Would, all their wines are probably decent. It wouldn't really matter which one you take. <laughs> so I would take a, a la carte. So, I mean, not a la carte, the one they give you with each with you, with each meal. And the great thing is it was the last evening. I could drink as much as I want, and I wouldn't have to worry about the hangover the next day because I would be, you know, wouldn't be around anymore. So it would be perfect. Absolutely. Uh, and perfect has been chatting to you for the last hour. I've had a really great time. And I hope in the future that we get to meet and have a a, a meal in a Michelin starred restaurant and a boatload of wine together at some point soon. That'd be great, Mike. Thank you for having me. A Mike on the Podium was devised and produced by Michael Seal with music by Ben Dawson. Next time, I chat to an Israeli conductor, who not only conducts, but he's also an international piano soloist. He founded the Suidama Ensemble in New York, and, in 2013, he founded the Geneva Camerata, where he's been music and artistic director ever since. But until then, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>